watch it. So, as you can see, if you haven't been following along, or if you've been skipping, uh, we have a slideshow program. I can page up and or, or go up and down through the slides. The slides have different fonts and font styles, and we can now load images and scale and crop them. So this is a scaled crop of this image that's up there in a tiny way. Uh, and we have a to-do list of what is yet to be done. So let's take a look at that. And actually the first thing on the to-do list last time was that there was a bug to fix where the program was crashing when loading textures of certain sizes. That has been figured out. Uh, I did that off the stream. I solved that problem off the stream because I figured it was going to be a tedious and annoying and stupid problem, and it was, so I didn't want to waste people's time with it. But what I will do is I'll go uh, look at what the problem was and, and show you the solution, right? So then um, someone was asking, well, what happens, you know, because we're using this text format to control the slides, oh, what if I want to make a line of text that starts with a colon or a hash? And that's a good point. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you backslash lines if you want. And then that's also going to take place of this blank command. We'll get rid of that because you could always just put backslash on an empty line. And that would mean, um, you know, a, a blank line. So we'll do that. Uh, I want to implement uh, some more image stuff like border color and size for images because I think that's useful. And then we'll start doing more application stuff. We'll see how far we get into this, but like window resizing uh, and aspect ratio. That's sort of one area of subject matter. And then we can start doing like rectangles and polylines or whatever. We probably, probably won't get to that tonight unless I stream a really long time. We'll see. Uh, and then variables and so forth. So that is the roadmap. Uh, let's talk about the GL problem. So we were experiencing last time a crash in the graphics driver when we load a texture map. And at the time, I thought it was maybe because the texture map was big and I scaled it down and it started working. But it started working because I scaled it down to a width that was an even number, which is terrible. So uh, what I had to do to fix this bug uh, with, with the aid of some people on Twitter was the following. When we upload the texture with GL Tech Image 2D, which is a standard way that you give it pixel data and say, make a texture map out of this that the GPU can use to draw images. Before we call that, we call GL Pixel Store and tell it the pack alignment, right? And if it's an RGB 888 image, if it has no alpha, then we have to give it an alignment of one, right? Otherwise, we get an alignment of four. Um, and, you know, if you know about CPU, CPUs and memory organization and alignment, and that'll make sense why that's necessary. Uh, if you don't, we'll just say it's a low-level processor kind of a thing. Um, what I will say is that this is a horrible API. It's embarrassing that this is still in OpenGL for several reasons, right? So one of them is like, okay, look, guys, we're giving you the width of the texture map and the format. And the width is an odd number and the format is an odd number, right? So you should be able to figure out that um, the alignment is, you know, is, is going to be required to be one. Now, the only reason I can guess, and they sort of passive aggressively hint at this in the documentation, the only reason I can guess that they don't do that automatically is because apparently some file formats round to the nearest four bytes. That's really dumb. I don't know of any standard format that does that right now. And if you were going to accommodate that in the most general way, you should do like Direct3D does or do like many other graphics APIs do and just provide the stride in bytes of how many bytes it is from one line to the other. And then you have a fully general mechanism that could handle all kinds of you know, ways of packing graphics. And you can even do things like, in, like you can do in Direct3D where if you give it a negative stride, then it flips the image as it uploads it, which you want to do sometimes, right? So that's really goofy and terrible. Um, and then the other thing that's goofy and terrible, well, is first of all that this is in a separate call than this one, because this is actually required really for this to work properly in many cases. Um, and you don't know that because they're totally 
decoupled things. Like if alignment were a parameter here that you had to type in, even if it worked the same way, it would be a little bit dumb, but you would still know that you needed to do it because you would have to type it to call the procedure, right? And they don't do that, right? And then the even worse thing is this is global state. Like you set this, this the value of some hidden state variable to some alignment and some other part of your program could like mess that up and you know if you don't set it right before you use it like maybe you set it at the beginning of your program and you're like okay it's fine but then if somebody else changes it you, you may not know that and it's screwy so it's bad for all kinds of reasons you know i i don't like OpenGL. um fortunately it didn't take too long to chase down or too long to fix so now uh when we load this image whoops when, when we load the image, we're loading it at full resolution now. Uh, never mind that we're drawing it really, really small. Okay. So, now that we have discussed that, I'm going to delete it from here. And let's do some backslashing. So, let's, let's add a slide. Let's do two things. So, these, these blank lines, do I only have one blank? Yeah, that's the only one. So... Uh, I'm going to change, <laughs> so first I'm going to make this line factor not be negative one anymore to flip the text, like that was fun for a while, but uh, I'm not going to do it. Um, we're going to do that backslash to make sure, I just want to keep it readable so I don't get confused looking for this blank line basically. I guess it would be easy to spot either way, but I want to minimize confusion. So we want to make sure that results in a blank line. And then let's do a slide, instead of our time slide of starting in one minute, um, we'll say this is a test of starting a line with colons uh, and also with hashes, which normally represent comments. So what we're going to do, so if we run this now, we're just going to see backslashes, right? Because, oh. Right, because I flipped my text, I have to start in a different place. Where's my hello sailor? We gotta start maybe there, maybe there. All right, eight, less, eight. Okay, so we see a backslash there, that's not great. And if we go down to the end of the presentation, uh, we see that. Oh, and this is interesting because So our format for parsing text files that we're using generically looks for hash marks generally uh, everywhere. And uh, always treats them as comments. So we're gonna wanna do something to get around that. That's gonna be a secondary problem. So the first problem is going to be recognizing backslash and dealing with it, and then the secondary problem is going to be dealing with the hash marks, which is a different issue. So, and we're also going to take out the blank command. So let's go to the source, uh, slides, let's look for blank, let's get rid of that. So before we add a line to a slide, we're going to do the following. If Well, I believe our line, our line's count always has to be greater than zero. We'll assert that for now. Uh, if line sub zero is equal to the character backslash, we're backslashing the backslash because backslash in strings means, you know, means what it means. So if that's the thing, then, um, Well, we just say, that's it. As far as I know, that's it. Advanced just skips us to the next character. Okay, so we got our blank line and we got our colons. So that's great. Uh, we don't have our hash marks yet. So I need to think about what I wanna do. I could just have a setting on the text file handler that we're passing about 
whether I think I'm going to do that about whether hash marks in the middle of a line represent a comment or not. So for machine format files, usually they would, and you just want the freedom to tag a line with a comment or something. But when you're making a slideshow, you want to, well, I mean, maybe you want to be able to put a comment anywhere. I mean, I, I definitely, uh, you know what, I'm just going to make it a, a mode for now. And if that's not sufficient, we'll do more later. So, oh, that's going to be in Sokoban because we're stealing its code. Text file handler. And, oh, we already have that. Strip comments from ends of lines. Oh, um, disable this if you or, or whatever your character is to be off the rest of the line. Wow, we already have the functionality we wanted. So in slides, we'll say handler. Handler dot that equals false. My text is too big. Yeah, we're going to have to do smaller text for this slide. We're going to leave this slide up for a while because it's a good test to stay enabled. So we're going to say 11, no, 8. Well, you know, we could break this into another line. All right. So... All right, so that's pretty good. That is check unable. Any questions about that? Oh, geez. This is, I forgot to check in one of the images before and Don't revert the wrong thing. Okay. Any questions? Use a character escape like in string literals. I don't know what you mean exactly. You mean escape? You want me to have to escape hash mark in the middle of the line anywhere? I don't want to have to do that. I mean, that might be the right answer later on for like generally handling lots of file formats. Ha having that option might be good. But when I'm working on slides, I just want to be able to type it without worrying about it. Do you not want to allow comments on lines that start with backslash hash? Is it not better to have to escape that second hand? No, it's not better. I just don't want... I took the option to not have comments at the end of lines is what I did. And I think that's fine. For a slideshow, I don't really need that. But you know, all these are just mildly arbitrary choices. And the thing is, I don't care that much about the text file format anyway. This is going to be graphically edited later anyway. So like sweating too much over details of this is not really worth it because this whole format is going to go away at some point in the future, right? This format, the job of it is to get me through like, you know, the next year or however long while I make, while I make uh, presentations this way before we have graphical editing. So that is that. Is that. He's not, I'm not trying that hard. Sometimes it's not appropriate to try that hard. Okay, so we did that. Um, let's do some more image stuff. Let's, let's get a different image. What's a good image? 
a good image. So I don't like these images. These are, that's, eh, eh. <laughs> well, okay, we could use good snowman, it's hard to build. Wait, no, I don't want to save there. I want to put it on my hard drive. Google is so bad. Google. Uh, let's see. Data shows. We'll call this one snowman.png. And you know what? Let's do some video game things. Let's go to... Uh, Let's go to media and let's get a screenshot if my freaking media page will load. We've just got, we've got really big assets on this page so if you decache them, what's a good witness shot? Oh, that one's all right. That one's all right. Let's take that one. Three point nine meg zip. That seemed like such a big. Seemed like such a big file. All right. Well, which one of these? No, no. All right. That was it, huh? We'll do the title screen. Now we'll do that one. Screenshot two. Subversion. All right. So let's make some slides that has that stuff. We'll put them at the start because why not? We're going to go, we're going to use section one, background. A very dark color and then I've got to load my images braid is called braid screenshot 2 Snowman and witness is called witness. All right, so let's do section two since that doesn't have an image. Was not able to find asset braid screenshot two. Oh, because I don't load JPEGs right now because I took it out because I thought that might have been the crash problem. Let me go fix that. Yeah, we took out JPEG. Let's put JPEG back in. All right, so we haven't positioned the image or anything yet. So, image braid, what are my options to image? Uh, position 50-50, scale 100. Whoa, okay. So, <laughs> this is having a color transformation happen on it that we don't want. 
when you upload images to OpenGL, you like tell it the properties of the image. And or maybe when we, I don't think it's when we page flip. I think we have something to debug here. That's what I think. All right. So there's that. Um, and we'll make another slide that's, uh, oh, you know what, let's put the section two over this so that we get the text over the image nicely blended. I don't, does Office, I guess, I guess we determined that Office does that, it's just bad. Okay, so yeah, so we definitely we're, we're definitely having some issues with the colors. Um, but let me just finish what I was doing. And, do witness grade. I'm going to need a fourth one. Anyway, uh, 25, 25, 75, 25, scale 50, scale 50. Oh, we're still covered up by snowman. So uh, 25, 75, scale 50. Oh, there we go. Um, so we need one more. I want, I want some, let's see. See, this is good because I want to have these screenshots in like an archive. Oh, is Steven Sausage Roll? Okay, that's 16 by 9. Is that, let's, that's going to be good enough, I think. Going to add that. And, oops, let's get our slideshow back up. And, okay, well, so our colors are not so good. But other than that, we're doing okay. The reason I did these is I'm going to want to I'm going to want to put borders around them. So let's make them a little bit smaller. Let's scale them like is 40 good? Yeah. So by the time we put borders around those, so let's fix the colors. Let's fix the colors. Um, I suspect, well, I was goofing around uh, with whether they're sRGB or not when I was editing um, OpenGL stuff. Oh, oh, I know what's going on. Um, oh, no. So I'm telling it this texture is sRGB which I think just means, it doesn't really mean it's sRGB. I think it just means exponentiate it when you sample it. I'm not sure what the semantics are of that, but like, yeah, so this is better. I, 
I don't really like the whole sRGB thing. I think it was a short-sighted extra way to confuse people and introduce bugs. All right. Anyway, oh, look at that great braid screenshot. It has an extra line at the bottom. That's great. Um, now, I think uh, we're going to add, what did I say, borders and border colors, which are like border collies, but not. So remember we had, when we say image, we sort of go out to this parse image properties, which has a whole bunch of different things. So we're going to add to that. So for example, scale color, well, we want to be able to say border color, right? And border color equals color. That's easy. And then uh, border width is a scalar, kind of like scale, right? Border width, image dot border width equals F. So again, this is not going to be in pixel units. It's going to be in like a fraction of the screen height, which seems to be our standard unit, times 100, <laughs> um, which I'm still not sure is a good idea. Okay, so now uh, we got to add those things to the image, right? So we say border color is a vector for uh, border width is 0 0.0. .0. Okay, now when we draw, again, we're going to do this post rotated. Okay, I could do this the sloppy way or the good way. And I'm going to do it the good way, which requires me to draw some geometry. So, so the thing is, I could draw four strips along the outlines of the image that overlap, right? That's what you would do if you're lazy. But then if we're going to alpha blend that, you'll see the overlapping, right? If you give a border color with an alpha that's not completely opaque. So what I want to do is draw something like this. Hopefully I'm holding the... Oh, shoot. Um, let me let me get a less a less messy, less confusing piece of paper. So the square is just the body of the image, and I'm just gonna go sort of out diagonally from each side, right? and do that. Now one question is, should those diagonals always be 45 degrees or should they be the aspect ratio of the image? I'm gonna make them always 45 degrees right now. So that's actually easy. I don't really need to draw anything. So, you know, if B is our border width, then, you know, we go to the side B and up B and that tells us this point, you know, so this point is just whatever point we already have figured out, right? And then we add these two vectors to get this point. Now, how do we get those vectors? Well, this vector is just this one, right? Uh, but normalized and then times the border width. And the other vector is just this one and just normalized towards the border, times the border width. So. That's all we're going to do. We're going to say if item dot uh, actually let's we probably are setting the shader up here. Yeah, so let's set the, the shader there to something that uses a texture and here to something that doesn't. So if item dot border width because if the, if the border width is zero, there's no reason to spend CPU and GPU drawing a zero width border. Uh, so we're going to say no texture for now. Maybe later we'll have textured borders, but it's not important right now. Um, and
and I will say, well, um, so the order in which I usually do this is P0, P1, P2, P3, like that. So uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. It's, I do it that way always. Um, that's counterclockwise. Those are the points that you would visit going counterclockwise from a lower left corner. And it's just being consistent about that um, makes me uh, not have to think so hard every time I do this kind of thing, which is often. Why counterclockwise? Because that's the direction that angles go um, if you just have a positive, you know, positively increasing angle going around the circle. If I was going to be really serious about this, maybe I would make this the first one and second and third and fourth. Because then if you started at the origin, those would be the ones that you would visit in order from a zero angle. But for some reason, early on, it made more sense to me to start in the lower left corner because that's traditional for other reasons. So my P0 is in the lower left corner. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say V, V12, well, what's the convention here? I don't know. V21, we'll just say that is unit vector of P2 minus P1, right? Um, V23 is unit vector of P2 minus P3. All right, so, well, actually, let's go further. Let's just call those, let's call those border X and border Y, because why not? Because if it's unrotated, they'll be in X and Y. And we're going to change that, multiply that by item dot border width times one point oh one. Oh, I haven't I haven't put a border width in the file yet. We'll do that. Okay. So anyway, we have this border x and border y, and we want to draw four quads. Um, I want to make four quads. We'll call them Q0 for the outer points. So, whoops. I should have written this more neatly. Anyway, so around the outer points, we're going to go Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, and then our quads are these four. So we'll go P0, P3, Q3, Q0, right? P0, Q0, Q1, P1, P1, Q1, Q2, P2, and so forth, right? And then I emit quads often, but then the lower level routine is going to break those into two triangles each and so on. So anyway, I can do this right now before I even compute what the Q vectors are. Um, I'm going to call a version where you don't supply UV coordinates because we don't have textured borders right now. I'm going to say, OK, we want a quad from um, P0, P3, Q3, Q0, right? We want P0, Q0, Q1, P1, uh, P1, Q1, Q2, P2, and P2, Q2, Q3, P3. Now, you'll notice for these last couple, the last two are the first two, because we're going back over in the opposite order, because we're going back over the edge we just did. So if I'm going to be consistent about that, I should do that here too. So let me do that. So P0, P3, Q3. Oh, no. OK, wait. That only works. Oh, I, oh, okay, I do. P0, P3, Q3. Zero. Okay, that only works. I'm going to reorder these a little bit because that only works if your last edge is an edge that's one of these diagonals that's shared by two quads. So let's do that. So instead of going P0, P3, I'm going to go P3, Q3, right, Q0, P0. And then the next one, so this is Q0, P0, and this is P0, Q0. Q1, P1, and then this is P1, Q1, Q2, P2, 
is P2, Q2. So you can see the pattern here between the letters and numbers. And uh, that's, it's just often that little bit of extra neatness in the code helps sometimes, right? Okay, so what are Q0, Q1, Q2, Q? Well, Q0 is P0 plus the vector of uh, minus Bx minus By, and then a, whoops, and then a similar kind of thing is true for all of these. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three. This is plus Bx minus By, this is plus Bx plus By, this is minus Bx plus By. Again, if you do this all the time, you just know what that's like. Okay, but this is not eye color anymore. This is um, eye border color. Where do we figure out eye color? Like once you start inserting code sometimes, like declarations can drift very far from where they're used. Oh, down there, so we couldn't use it anyway. All right, so I border color. Now I'm only converting this to U32 because my API takes that, but you know, really in the long term, we probably shouldn't be quantizing colors anymore because it's the year 2017 and it introduces artifacts sometimes. So um, later we'll deal with that. So that I feel like in principle, I've typed everything I need to. I probably got some things wrong. So uh, incompatible structs. Oh, we don't have a unit vector for vector 2. Let's make that. Vector 2. Blah, 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 blah. We don't have unary minus for vector 2 either. Wait. Operator minus. It's like, all right. It, it feels really tedious and annoying to me to define all these things, but then sometimes you just want to use them. It's just weird. It's weird to pay for compiling all this stuff every time. I don't know. Okay. Oh, duh. No, 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 no. Okay, I don't... So I'm being dumb. So this, making a vector 2 out of these, these aren't scalars. These are vectors, right? So uh, really, I want to do the following. I want to just do this, which is look simpler and nicer anyway. So I'm, I'm doing the same thing in principle of what I just did, but this is... Plus, this is plus, this is plus, this is plus. Well, that compiles. All right, so the question is what happens when I start trying to use this? Um, uh, my show. All right, so uh, border width. I don't know, 3% three, three of the screen? That seems kind of wide, but we'll see what happens. Uh, border color 1111. One, one. Well, it didn't do anything. Noticeable. Border width 30. Oh, now we see something. Okay, I, I messed up my quads somehow. So it, it is drawing things. And let's make sure the color is working. All right. So I just goofed on my geometry, which is honestly not that surprising. Let's move this slide up to the front so that it's the first thing we see every time we run. Um, and then, so down here, I was drawing the border second. Um, well, let's draw it, 
or I was drawing it first, but let's draw it second so that I can see how I goofed. It's not really helping me. Well, it looks like I didn't goof super bad. So I'm drawing it on top of the image now instead of under the image. I probably got my X's or Y's in the wrong direction because I changed my mind about what I was doing about that early on. Um, okay, so first of all, oh, we're not multiplying the border width by the screen height, so that's a mistake. And then second of all, if you look at these, it looks like the triangle is kind of Oh, I don't know exactly what it's doing. I'm just going to recheck. You can sort of see how it's kind of bending down. Oh, the sign, yeah. The sign of the... Something's wrong. <laughs> something's wrong. But we got something. If we just wanted this to be like a cool 50s slideshow program, we'd be done. We would just check this in. Or if we were on Linux, we'd be done, and we'd just check it in and say, patches, welcome. Uh, but that's not what we're doing. We're getting it right today. Um, all right, so times uh, back buffer height audit. Because we're, we're going to change this later in this session, probably, if we get there. If we don't get buried in bugs. Accidentally got a border that looks cool. It's true. Um, all right, so what did I do? I said BX is, oh, no, I got my X and Y back. Yeah, it's because I was changing my mind and stuff. I said BX is 2 minus 1, but really that's the Y. And X is 2 minus 3, right? So... So now I'm going to have a giant, what? Uh oh. So we don't have an overload for multiplying a vector by an integer, I think is what just happened. Yeah. All right, so now I have such a huge honking border, it's getting behind everyone. So let's go back and uh, make our border with a reasonable number. Hey, two, border color. I don't know, what's a good border color? Let's, let's give some color to the background. Uh, Wait, why did that background not happen? Oh, because our, uh, yeah, our, our use slide overrode our background. Okay. So, okay, so now we're blending a whitish color with the background color to give us like a transition. It's still an ugly background color, but whatever. So, and if I wanted to make my newest game seem cooler than the other games, I just give it a stronger border and it just stands out more. Except the braid screenshot is brighter and the good snowman has more blocks of color, but whatever. Whatever, man. How about we'll make it whiter too? So that's decent functionality. Emacs config files are off topic for today. Have I ever secretly participated in Ludum Dare? No. All right.
Wait. So now we got to do a good job of resizing the window because, whoops, wrong program. Stop, stop. Okay, when we resize the window, bad stuff is going to happen. Like, yeah, that's not great. So what's happening is our GL viewport is just staying in the lower left-hand corner of the window, right? Um, which is not how you're going to want your slideshow to behave. So we want to scale. So the first thing we're going to do is scale our back buffer uh, as DL changes. And to handle that, um, I'm just going to use some code out of Sokoban because that already did it. Um, then we'll check that in. But the problem then will be uh, our stuff will distort uh, at least our positions will be wrong. Um, our images probably won't distort. It depends on what I did exactly, but uh, our positions will certainly be wrong uh, as the aspect ratio changes, and we don't want that. So then after that, we'll make a way of declaring an aspect ratio for the presentation, and then, you know, centering that aspect ratio on the screen. Okay. Let's do that. So, in main, I think we already have a stubbed out call to handle resizes. Where is that? Is that an OpenGL handle re no? No, all right, let's find out where it is. This program is slow. So what we're going to do is we're going to return true from this if we resized. So that the caller, because I want to make this a little more generic and shareable between programs. The problem is there's things you want to do when you resize. Like we don't have this HDR buffer stuff. Um, So, um, I know I initialize, well, actually maybe we don't need either of these in this program. I don't think we do. Uh, we do want to clean up, um, reset, or incomplete, reset all font textures so that we don't use huge amounts of texture of memory for old sizes we're no longer using, right? Because you want your fonts to scale as your window scales. And because I'm making these texture atlases that have font characters in them, then every time you scale your window, you're going to want different sized characters. And so that's just a comment to go do that later. Um, do I not? Wait, yeah. I don't have a 
I don't have a D-back buffer right now. I may get it back later. All right. Who knows what's going to happen here? Hey, that was pretty good. I mean, that's kind of blurry. I don't know what you guys are seeing. You guys are seeing it slightly blurry because you're at 1080. That's pretty good. Pretty good. That's great. Nice and crisp letters. That's great. Now, where things are going to get funny is if I start doing weird aspect ratios, right? Because, um, you know, we're scaling things by the back buffer height, which is now no longer an aspect ratio that we expected, right? So, you know, things are going to be weird now. And if we go the other way, an overly widescreen, that's not so bad because things fit, except like our justifications and our font sizes are totally off, right? So, but that's good. You know, we said this was going to happen. So the next thing is uh, defining aspect ratio for the presentation. So all we did here, you see our handle resizes is, is pretty simple. We have this did something resize, which just checks some bools that we set somewhere. And we just call GL viewport, which resizes the back buffer. Now later, when we get to rendering into off screen buffers, which we're gonna do, um, then we have to do some other things. Uh, that was what all that DHDR buffer stuff was that I deleted. Um, but for now, this is actually just very simple. We're just calling GL viewport. Someone saying, so if you design a presentation for 16 by 9 and have a projector of 4 by 3, it would add black or background colored bars top bottom? Yes, basically. I mean, I guess you could have an option to not do that and just cut off part of your presentation if you wanted to, but I'm not sure why you would want that. Will there be a way to export to something like PDF for easy sharing? Um, I don't know because we'll see. Because you're a little bit assuming something about the medium that this is a non-interactive presentation, but I'm building this for interactive presentations. Now you don't see that yet because you know the stuff in here is not interactive, uh, but eventually it will be. So I don't know. Um, We'll see. I mean, I guess if you make a non-interactive presentation with it, it's very easy to export it to something like a bunch of bitmaps, um, you know, and put those in an HTML document or something. That's very easy. Uh, you know, getting into stuff like PDF, which is a proprietary file format, I, that's a little uglier, but I guess people have open source PDF converters now or something. Mr. Van Dievender asks the question that five people ask me every stream. And so does Sharundar. And so does IOF Bastion. Sorry guys, I've answered those questions so many times I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I need to make a, a frequently asked questions so that people don't ask. Why not make the presentation language, the programming language itself, e.g. use functions? Several people asked that on YouTube today. And the answer is because if I do that, then that's not very amenable to having a graphical editor. Like what would the graphical editor edit if you have no declarative form of your presentation? You wouldn't have one. You would just be programming, right? So I want to make something where it's easy to whip up a slideshow easy to put it together with a graphical editor, even if you're a non-programmer. And then if you're a programmer and want to easily add interactivity, you can. But I don't want to require you to program in a programming language designed for experts in order to make a slideshow. That's just not what I'm doing. Am I going to do fancy font layout stuff like shaping? That's already handled. Well, it's already handled in the witness version of this code and we're gonna port it over later. 
that's going to be boring enough that we probably won't do it on the stream. Who is my favorite Game of Thrones character? I don't watch Game of Thrones anymore because ever since it went past the book, like last season, it just turned into cheesy TV writing that completely betrayed the nature of the whole universe. Uh, I mean, it was a... It was a kind of a cheesy lowest common denominator show before that, but like once the writing became terrible, I just couldn't do it anymore. So um, I'm not watching this season out of protest. Very few people noticed that the entire show betrayed its the foundations of its world building last season. So I guess most people are happy with it, but uh, I, I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. It was too bad. So that's all. You've been watching all my interviews recently as you're looking for a way out from being a designer in a mobile game company. Good luck with that because, yeah, it's you don't get to design very much in those companies, right? So uh, go, go work on Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, man. Move to Korea. It'll be great. It's the hot game. All right. I haven't read the books. I can't tell you who my favorite character is from the books. I have not read the books. I'm simply speaking of the world building that was this, the nature of the universe that was depicted in the first seasons, which I believe, you know, keeps somewhat closely to the kind of universe that the books probably were. But I don't know. I haven't read them. I'm just telling you, they set something up and then face planted so hard and, and they can't even tell they did it, right? It's just. Nah. Nah. Okay, I don't care. It's, it's, a, it's a TV show. Okay. Where are we at here? I gotta remind myself, because people are asking about Game of Thrones, which is not particularly on topic. Okay, so we did image borders. Oh yeah, we did, okay, we gotta do aspect ratio so that this doesn't happen. Now I suppose, okay. Um, Here's how we're going to do this. So first we're going to do the easy part, which is declare the aspect ratio in the slideshow. And if you don't declare it, it'll be a default of probably 16 by 9, I guess. I don't know. Um, so we'll do that. And then the thing is that we then have to make sure things show up on the screen in the right way. One way to do that would be to change all our calculations, you know, to like bias and add to get to the middle of the screen, but I don't feel like that's the right way to do it, especially because we're going to be wor working with off-screen surfaces as we, um, as we uh, start doing more complicated things, like doing an overview mode and uh, doing transitions and stuff. So I think what we're going to do is always render to an off-screen surface. Um, it's not going to be an HDR surface like it is in Sokoban. It's going to be a regular LDR surface. Uh, but we will always render to that and then blit that to the, the back buffer at the end and then page flip the back buffer to the front buffer, right? So we'll do that before trying to make the aspect ratio come all the way to the screen. Um, and then then when we do GL viewport, we figure out what size the off-screen buffers should be and resize those independently of the back buffer, right? Then we can just, 
draw to the whole canvas however we want. And then when it's time to display the slide, we just do a single quad render of the back buffer onto the, or the, the off-screen buffer onto the back buffer. That seems to me like the most sensible way to do it. What happens when the opacity of an image is less than that of its border? Won't it look wonky or should people not do that? I don't know. I mean, it'll look like what it looks like. The border isn't, can, the border is not behind the whole image. It's just around the image. So you won't get any of the border color. Um, so for example, uh, if I say scale color, on the witness, uh, 1110, which should make it disappear, right? We still, we just have a border around it, right? So it's not filling. Um, so you only have one color to contend with, which is the background color. Uh, so 0 0.5, 0 0.3. I mean, that looks like what it looks like, right? If you want that, it's fine. Uh, if you don't want that, that's fine too. Are we, are we, sat we're saturating the alpha at one right now because because of the shader, but you could, in theory, go higher than one as well. Oh, earlier someone asked about borders on cropped or rotated images. Uh, what did we call it? Ro rotation. Okay, rotation 30. There you go. What is somebody doubting that I do things in a quality manner? Like, what kind of people are you? Of course that works. Jeez. Can we rotate it into the third dimension? Not currently, no. I mean, I should have Snakebird. Let's, you know, I'm probably, like I said, I'm gonna have a, like a long-term database of slides. And one of those things should be games to talk about. So actually we'll do that, we'll do that in the after. Like when I'm tired of doing real work, uh, get screenshots of good games to talk about. Somebody remind me to do that before we sign off if I don't remember. Okay, we're going to go into the slideshow. I'm going to define the aspect ratio as 16 by 9 to start. And we'll make sure that parses. Case aspect. Let's put that in your... I have something else that's just a scalar. Yeah, size is just a scalar. All right. Okay. If aspect ratio is already set by the user, then we'll error.
make a check for junk thing, but eh. eh, I don't always do it consistently anyway. Okay, so. We're gonna say aspect ratio set by user starts as false. Aspect ratio x is float. Oh, if ax is equal to zero, error, handler, uh, attempt to set a zero aspect ratio. Right, so you can't have either. A zero or negative. All right, if x is less than or equal to zero or a y is less than or equal to zero. So no horseplay with the numbers. Otherwise we do that. And we'll default to 16 by 9. Okay, let's make sure that compiles. Oh, this is no result. I hope somebody caught that. What am I doing? I'm on drugs today, man. I'm so tired. What was that if doing? So many mistakes. All right. All right. So we didn't complain about that line. Uh, let's actually print it. Right aspect is now 16.0 by 9.0. Okay. Now. Day. Okay, so we want to, as I said, okay, we're going to forget about aspect ratios for a little while now that we've set this. And we're just, what we're just going to get working now is creating an off screen surface for the slides. And for now, that's just always going to be like, 1280 or uh, 1920 by 1080. It's always going to be 1080p. Um, and then we'll be back to where we were before, <laughs> probably. Uh, or it'll end up stretching, probably. I don't know. We're going to start doing it, and we're going to see in what order it comes out. All right, all right, so we get rid of this. We say, this whole slides file is just 704 lines. That's not bad. All right. I'm gonna need a caffeine break of some kind soon. Let's, let me, do one thing. What I'm going to do is this, the HDR buffer stuff, I'm going to start bringing that back. Um, and for now, I'm just going to say the off screen buffer. 
Later we'll have many off-screen buffers because, well, we probably won't have one for every slide, but we'll have a pool of them because you may, you want to maybe render into multiple ones and then you know blend them together to generate an output effect or something. So, yeah. But for now, to get it started, we have only one. So anywhere, I'm just looking for the HDR here. Um, in init OpenGL, I'm going to say the off screen buffer is create texture render target. And I don't remember, this is something about is it HDR or not, and does it have a depth target or not? We'll modify that to taste, probably. Uh, okay, so... No, not 1080, 1920 by 1080. All right. The reason I made this the back buffer before is because when you say set render target, I want to be able to use my abstraction of a texture map as opposed to using OpenGL's handles all the time. So I make a texture map that represents the back buffer. And so we're going to need that. I need to get my Emacs theme that de-emphasizes these, but I'm not using that one right now. Okay. So the back buffer. Blah 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 blah. All right. Oh, let's go. Let's go to the Sokoban version. So the HDR. Say size, color, target. So we're not going to handle resizing yet. So we're not going to do any of that. Okay, so we're going to look for, let's see if we already have create texture render target. No. All right. So the reason we're pasting all of this stuff, some people would look at this and say, oh, you're pasting all this code. That's so bad. But it's like, actually, we don't really want it to do the same thing necessarily. Although maybe in this case we do. I don't know. I don't actually know. Um, right, so we have a color target potentially and a depth target that we're returning. So we GL gen frame buffers. Color target, size the color target. I don't have that. created a thing called the off-screen buffer, right? Uh, we're not actually, we're not actually using it. So we have to do that. So we have this set render target routine. And that, of course, is not simple. Like, in theory, your API should make this stuff simple, but, you know. And then we're going to set the render target. 
okay, maybe it's the back buffer, maybe it's a frame buffer object, and then if we're multi-sampling or not, we have to do different things. I guess just this is different. It's like, okay. Um, I don't know. It's just boilerplate junk that goes there. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to, in main, set the render target, draw, and then set it back. So not in Sokoban. Okay. Okay. Set render target the off screen buffer GL clear color uh, zero zero one one clear color and depth okay. so. I'm actually going to do this here because I want to just make sure this works. Set render target the back buffer and do all that stuff. Set render target here and do this stuff. So if I mess this up, we'll just see green. And if I didn't mess it up, we'll be filling the back buffer with green. Uh, is missing? Oh, really? Do I have to set by render target index? Yes. And we assert that it's zero anyway because we only have one render target. In the future, we may have more. All right. Oh, got to do that as well. OK. Um, so now what's happening is I'm setting the render target and when we call that it's setting back buffer width and height and then when we restore it like we're not setting back buffer width and height back to what they should be or render target width something weird is going on it In some sense, it actually doesn't matter. See how it was right for the, it was correct for the first frame? Let's watch that again. It's correct the first frame. Ba boom. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I care to debug it. I suppose I should, because it may matter. It may confuse things. Um, let me see. So what happens if I do this? Like, I may have some state dependency on what... No. That did not matter. Well, let's put this up back where we actually want it. Because what we will eventually be doing is rendering to the off-screen buffer first anyway. So let's do that. We should see, okay. Well now, now the first frame isn't correct anymore. So it is something about this. Just for my own information, I'm going to say print uh, the back buffer is, this will tell me the dimensions of the back buffer. So 1574 by 829. Um, so if we're rendering at 1920, then uh, it's, yeah, we're, that would be what we would expect. 
because we're seeing a 1500 cut out of a 1920 image, right? Um, so we're somehow, I don't understand why it is that we're doing that, but it is something that should be debugged for sure. It's not, it's probably not going to naturally go away as we do this, although it might. Um, so, I mean, I, when we call, okay, wait. Do I have to call GL viewport? Why am I not calling GL viewport back here? I suspect that's a bug. Yeah. Okay, so that's fixed. So we're in principle drawing to a back buffer. Let's use uh, what's it called? It render doc to make sure that we have a back buffer. Um, text reviewer cap or capture executable uh, C show run tree show exe launch. And uh, boom. Okay. Uh, texture viewer. Back buffer color, back buffer depth. Wait, it's not. Green star, GL clear. Oh, blue, not green. Texture 2D, render target. How do I get the information for this render target? Uh, 1920 by 1081 MIP. Okay. RGBA 16F? <laughs> no. Okay, so it's the wrong format. That's fine. Uh, the reason it's the wrong format is because we pasted that code from our. Uh, HDR thing. Okay, hold on. The off screen buffer. Okay, we're passing true and true, and we really want just nothing. Okay, now, since we're going to be rendering to this thing anyway. Now let's go to a, a phase where we say set render target um, You know what? We're just going to do the following. We're going to paste all this code again. So we're going to get rid of our blue here and we're just going to render the whole scene twice. Right, because this clears the color and then draws a slide, and this clears the color and draws a slide. So we're just going to draw the same thing to both buffers right now. Okay, so we're still seeing our front buffer one, and we'll run render doc again. And we capture that. How do I ever know if it's, well, I guess I'll look at it. Um, so we do a bunch of drawing. So this is the render target, and we see that, okay, it's it's 1080, it's wide, uh, and and we're not um, we're not rendering to the whole texture, which again I'm not sure why, but we'll debug that, and then again to the back buffer we're rendering the whole thing. Okay, so we're rendering the scene twice. 
Now we want to fix this. Um, oh, right, and the reason, remember when I said audit on the back buffer width, the reason is we don't want to use the back buffer width. Um, we need to search for back buffer width and height pretty much everywhere and replace that by render target width and height. see if that was enough or if it's still screwy. Uh, well, that won't tell us, so we need to run this again. I close that one. Okay. Texture viewer. Hey, there we go. So this is 1080p, and we're drawing an image to the whole thing, right? And then this guy is littler. See, he's only 829p, and we're also drawing the image at the correct scale. So that's good. Any questions about what's happening so far? Nick Khan says, shouldn't you be positioning your rendering stuff based on the off-screen buffer instead of the back buffer? Yes, and that is what I just did. Render target width and when render target height get set to the dimensions of the off-screen buffer when you set an off-screen buffer. What is that a good snowman thing from? That is a game that you can play on Steam called A Good Snowman is Hard to Build. How did you debug OpenGL before RenderDoc? Uh, well, there were some other programs before that, but before those programs, you just didn't debug OpenGL. It was just very painful and horrible. It still is painful and horrible, it's just less painful and horrible. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is um, blit the back buffer to the front buffer. And we're going to do the following. Um, we're not going to worry about getting the size right yet or anything. We're going to, um, oh, I've got to, I've got to write down, uh, okay, so our to-do list is expanding out a little bit. We need to do the following. We need to um, draw back buffer to front buffer at correct size um, we need to or no draw off screen buffer to back buffer at correct size we need to uh, resize off screen buffer as aspect ratio of window and back buffer That's not too many items. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. So, remember when I just said we're drawing the whole scene twice? Where was that? Here it is. So, we were drawing it once, and then we're setting a new render target and drawing it again. Well, now. We're going to get rid of that second time. Instead, we're going to say set shader exactly sure what I think about that so you know because if we if we draw things I usually like to have a shader that's meant exactly for color to color copies because you know otherwise you might 
perturb things by a little bit and get a slightly blurry output or something. But I, I don't think that's really a danger here. We'll see. Okay. So I'm going to set the writer target and um, rendering 2D right handed. And uh, I'm going to do a quad. What are my options? Zero, one, two, three, color. I don't have anywhere I just do a width and height. So I'm going to compute some vectors here. I'm going to say P0, zero, zero, zero. P1 is V2, uh, W0. You know what? We're, we're going to say there is a border in all this. Well, yeah. We're going to say the border is O.1, width is O.5, and height is O.5. We're going to go from BB to B plus WB to B plus WB plus H to uh, B, B plus H. Right, so that's our points, and then we'll uh, immediate begin, immediate quad, P0, P1, P2, P3, immediate flush. Um, let's clear, before we do that, let's clear the background color to like a kind of a dark red. Okay, well, we got the dark red. Oh, we didn't set the texture. Okay, we still got nothing. Um, okay, I'm drawing at the wrong scale here. I'm, I'm doing this at unit scale, so we're drawing all this into the pixel at the lower left corner of the screen. Um, because at first I was going to type right-handed unit scale here, but then I was like, no, because we want to line things up pixel perfect with whatever the borders end up being for aspect ratio adjustment. So this is going to be 0.1 times uh, back buffer uh, height, let's say, right? And H is going to be, we're going to draw this distorted into a square for now. Hey, okay. So that is our slideshow going into an off-screen buffer, right? And then coming out here. So now we want to draw it in the correct aspect ratio. And what that is, is going to depend on the window dimensions, right? So if the window is wider than us, if the window's aspect ratio width divided by height is higher than ours, then we want the extra space to be at the sides, right? If it's lower than ours, if it's a tall, skinny window, we want the extra space to be at the top and bottom. So we're going to do the following. Window aspect is... Um, back buffer width divided by back buffer denom, which denom, not demon, uh, min, no, max of one and back buffer height. Right. And then uh, render target just in case these end up zero somehow, like I think if you iconify in Windows or, or you know minimize, it'll do that. Whatever, you know. Okay, we've got our two aspect ratios.
Now we say, okay, we need two border numbers here, first of all. We need a border in the x and a border in the y. Right? So these are all bx, these are all by. Okay, so we have bx, by, w, h, r, float. Um, let's just say for, so w and h, yeah, let's just say right now, w is cast to float of render target width. Later, we might want to adjust that, but for now, we're gonna size the render target well. We're gonna resize the render target with the window eventually, but we're not doing that yet. So what we're doing right now in this initial test, we're gonna keep our render target displaying at the same size, 1080p, and we're just dealing with the window resizing around it. So if we make the window a lot narrower than 1080p, then we'll just end up cropping this, I think, is what'll happen. Uh, and then when we actually resize it, then we'll Although, I mean, we're going to have to decide what the policy is because there's many reasons why you might want to draw into off-screen targets at various sizes. Okay, so if uh, window aspect is greater than render target aspect, then uh, empty spaces are on the sides. Otherwise, empty spaces are in the top and bottom margins. All right, so um, we're just going to say uh, bx equals a half of um, floor of a half of we don't want to draw a half pixel off if the window size ends up an odd number um, of uh, back buffer width minus render target width, right? And then here is by is the same thing, back buffer height minus render target height, let me capitalize that. Redecoration, oh, I didn't, right. Okay, what's gonna happen? That didn't completely, I made some really basic mistake. Like it's it's getting cro cropped. What? I'm not sure how that's happening. Oh, it's getting cropped. Like, I feel like it's getting cropped to the original aspect ratio thing of the back buffer. Like, I feel like we're just, we're, we're not able to render beyond that. Like, maybe my GL viewport didn't work the way I thought it did or something. See what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Regardless, okay, so let me, tr let me try and make this a little bit more correct anyway. So, uh, 
we don't actually we don't actually need this logic here. We need this somewhere else. We need to know this when we're sizing the off-screen buffer. We don't need it now. Because now we're just going to say, look, whatever size the off-screen buffer is, we're going to do the following. We're going to say bx, well, we're just going to say this. This is always true for both these variables. We're just going to put it in the middle of the window at all times. Okay, so that's correct there. Okay, it's still correct. Yeah, we have some kind of GL viewport problem here. Um, or we're not, we're not correctly sizing the back buffer. I may have forgotten to do that. S handle resizes. Oh, well I need that probably because my, my transform setting stuff needs to know. Remember I said I have my texture map abstraction and if I don't update the width and height in there, bad things can happen. Um, I think. I don't know if, for sure if that's what went wrong, but it's at least bad. Yeah, it is. Okay. Wait. What is happening now? Now I'm confused because I don't think that setting that should have caused this behavior. I think I should still be seeing an unstretched image. So. Uh. I mean, this is, we shouldn't be doing this, but I don't think it'll affect what's actually happening. This is when I wish I'd had more caffeine. The problem is in principle simple. Well, first of all, let's, uh, let's run some render doc and make sure that, that what we think should be in the off-screen buffer still is, right? Whoops, I closed the wrong thing. How do I get that back? Okay, thanks for making me retype this. All right, so print screen that. We'll get another one. Print screen, close. So we're gonna look at this one. Text reviewer. So, that's a render target, it's 1080p, it is not stretched. This one is, what are you doing? Okay, this is 1800 high, it is stretched. Okay, this is all as expected so far. Um, Okay, we're just giving to the vertex buffer, I must have screwed something up. Because we're just giving the dimensions of the window to the vertex shader, which is of course gonna stretch. What did I do? How, did, what? So BX is floor of. So this is saying BX and BY are always zero. Oh, because, oh my God, because render target is the back buffer right now. Because we set the render target to the back buffer. Dumbass. Alright, 
So that's what I expect, that's what I expect, that's what I expect, that's what I expect, that's what I expect. Okay, so now we're nicely centering the slide in the middle of the thing. And now the problem is just that the slideshow is, oh wait, our font sizes are still using the back buffer. Let's fix that. Um, you know, but the other problem is just our, uh, Our, our slides are not ever changing from 1080p, right? So what we really want to do is go as wide as we can or as high as we can and still fit in the window. Uh, okay, let me fix the font thing and then, where is that? Do I do that in slides? Oh, that's so bad. Wait, get font. So that's why we didn't see it, because I only replaced the back buffer height in the other thing. All right. So I'm going to maximize, and our text is now the right size. That's good. OK. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Now we just need to decide um, how big the off-screen buffer should be. And for that, I'm going to get my, we're going to use a modification of, of this kind of a thing. Um, but we're going to do it here. Right, so if we resized, as I said before, we need to do application specific stuff. Um, so we figure out our aspect ratio there. And um, instead of saying render target, blah, 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 we don't have a render target dimensions yet because that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to use that aspect ratio that's set on the slideshow. Remember when we did that? Uh, this one. So we're going to say, so our desired aspect is going to be blah. And now, if window aspect is greater than desired aspect, then we do the following. Um, then um, our height is the back buffer's height. Let's, let's call this back buffer aspect, because why throw a window in out of nowhere when so if the back buffer is wider than we want to be, then we use its height as our max height, and then the spare space goes on the sides. So in that case, we say uh, render, or uh, let's say uh, h w h our float h equals uh, back buffer height width equals um, back buffer width divided by desired aspect, right? Because that's times height over width. I believe that's right. So otherwise, our width is the back buffer's width. So in that case, W equals back buffer width and h equals um, w divided by desired s. What? How is that wrong? So one of these two is wrong. It's this one that's wrong. Oh, because we don't, yeah, 
W equals H times desired aspects. Yeah, I hope somebody caught that in the stream. Someone's saying, is the white during resizing going to be fixed? Maybe. I mean, the thing about that is, um, if you're going to be resizing your buffers every frame, that can be hard on the GPU a little bit. Like, you could cause it to fragment its memory in a bad way or something. There's, there's nothing in principle from preventing us from doing that. So we'll, we'll think about that. Uh, okay, so once we have our width and height, then we do the following. Um, size, render target, right? Isn't that what it's called? Size, color target. Size, color, target. Uh, the off screen buffer false weight size color target. Where the width and height are coming from the texture map. So um, the off screen buffer dot width is cast to int, I guess, if it's int, floor w. It might be sign 32. Right. Okay. Undeclared identifier, desired height. Right. Um, divided by, this is um, aspect ratio y. With the slide show that aspect ratio x number mismatch float versus integer yeah okay it's sign thirty two like I said so. Okay, hey look, we have a thing, and then it's got some extras on the sides. I guess, because we start in some slightly different aspect ratio. Hey look, hey look, hey look, whoops. Isn't that great, isn't that great? Isn't it great when stuff just works the first time? So yeah, um, do we want to draw when resizing? I'm not sure. So like you could send a WM paint on it, but we're not we're not that kind of Windows application where we respond by messages. So I'm not actually sure how you tell Windows to. Does anyone in chat know how to make a game tell Windows to draw it in this case? It's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever cared about that. But yeah, so this is good. Um, we're, we're doing good. Okay, I'm going to prep some tea so that I have a little bit of caffeine. Mild, it'll be green tea. Um, and then we'll do some Q&A in a few minutes. So, oh, what was it that I reminded people? Get screen we could just do fun screenshot good game time, but um, we'll see. So let me say...
five minute break for tea, then some Q and A. And now, oh, dude, it's so cool because. Because now it can be full screen. Look at that. It's hitting you right in the face. We couldn't have done that before today. Invalidate rect and breed raw window. OK, remind me to do that in the Q&A, and we'll do that. It might take a little longer than five minutes to warm up the water. We'll see.
Someone says the timer is not async. Yeah, um, kerning is probably actually not good right now. I will say that. Uh, let, so what we're probably going to do at some point is, you know, drop in Harfbuzz to do the shaping. Um, I'm not thrilled by having to do that, but uh, we kind of have to for international language support right now. Um, and then once we do that, like Harfbuzz does it, uh, it does, you know, kerning as well because that's part of the whole shaping job. You may want WM Paint from the Windows message loop. I don't, I don't think so, but. Yeah, this is, this is not an open source font, but I'm also, so I'm definitely not using ligatures right now. Uh, and I may not be kerning at all. So don't blame them for the weird spacing between the letters. That is just something that we will deal with a little bit later. What about the ability to tile an image across the whole window like a simple textured background? Who wants to do that? Isn't that just like, oh, you mean like a, where you won't, wouldn't notice the repeat pattern? Um, we could do that pretty easily. In fact, that's, that's simple. Let's put that on the list. Oh. I guess we're officially, I'm having the rest of my chicken dinner right now. YouTube, Curve, Stomped, PowerPoint, what's next in your crosshairs, Excel, Emacs, Word, or Photoshop? I have to finish Curve Stomping C++ first. Uh, that's not that easy. Um, I mean, it's easy in terms of defining a language, but it's not that easy when you're going to do all the work end-to-end -end to really make a practical alternative. So, but we're getting there. We're getting there. I mean, I might as well do tiling just in case. I don't like tiling generally, but, you know, if it's a relatively unobtrusive pattern and whatever. The typical method for drawing during resize was to handle the WM enter size move, start a temp timer, and call your equivalent draw next frame while that's running. Oh, that's so horrible. There's no way I'm going to do that. Someone's asking, how do you balance building the language Silkabon in this presentation software? How do you choose when to do what? I don't know, man. I just do what I feel like when I feel like. I'm also working on witness stuff right now. So, like during daytime hours this week, I've been programming on the witness. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of things. Will I add GIFs and video embedding? Well, maybe video. I don't, like animated GIFs, I think are dumb. I don't understand that. Uh, but video embedding, maybe, sure. At what point do I stop implementing features with the slides eventually being imperatively programmed versus declarative with this format? Where's the line? 
Well, I wouldn't ever say that I want the slides to be completely imperatively or declaratively programmed or imperatively programmed, right? You want a simple way to declare the simple things and then you want to be able to hook in code to do the complicated things. So it's just a judgment call about what's simple and what's complicated. I would go so far as to say that anything that I know I want to do in every single presentation should probably be declarative, right? You shouldn't have to write code to do something that you're going to want to do every time. Uh, and then beyond that, who knows? Has working with this slideshow program made me think of any new language features? No, not really. This, is, this program is so simple compared to the problems that the programming language is meant to actually solve. Like a, a slideshow app is, is not pushing the boundaries of what the language is designed for, let's say. You could draw on WM sizing WM move. But like doing anything from inside the message loop is really dumb because you don't know what the state of the universe is when you're in that callback, right? You want to be in control of drawing the scene at any given time, right? You always want to draw from the body of your main program. It's like the biggest, the whole callback message loop thing is like the biggest screw up in Windows and they've never fixed it. It's just the worst idea. All right, well, let's do tiling. Since it was asked for, let's make, we'll make a thing called tile on image. So um, I'll call it U-scale and V-scale because we might have a U-offset and a V-offset as well. Um, so on slide image, UV-scale, uh, like I said, I don't have good uh, struct literals yet. When I have good struct literals, Set this to one one. Okay. Okay. So in this image stuff, we're going to have UV scale. And it will parse the U scale of the image. And then V, success V, remainder V is string to float. Unable to parse the V scale. All right, uh, image dot UV scale is V2, U comma V, remainder V. All right, and now when we draw, we say um, here we go draw image uh, u uh, item dot uv scale dot x v call it v us and vs uh, VS, VS, US, US. Oh, it was called Success U. Success U, Success V, Success. All right. So, 
Whoa, I didn't like what happened. We're going to have to debug later what's happening in the first frame there. Because that was kind of interesting. Okay, but um, let's test what we just came to test, which is we're on our first slide, and we'll say, uh, did I call it UV scale? Uh, 3, 3. Hey, there we go. You can't totally tell because it's a bit of a noisy image. Let's do that to Steven Sausage Roll. Hey, let's do 2-2. Two, two. Let's do 11.1 and minus 1. Oh, by the way, you can flip images this way now, right? So if I go 1 minus 1, we flip in Thought. Unknown image property. Really? What is happening? I screwed up something. Line 83, 81. Oh, it's not totally. Okay, we're not parsing correctly. So we must be like using the same number for both dimensions and not, yeah, okay, that has to get fixed. Uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, we're, we're string to floating RHS both times. It should be a remainder U, right? Okay, it's always good to test these things. Here we go. Uh, so you see the witness is four by one. That's really disgustingly stretched. Um, four by four. Uh, minus one by one. That'll flip it horizontally, right? Flip, 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 and then flip it vertically. So that's great. Um, You know, it's just it's just a thing. Okay. Close this. I wonder what is happening the first no wrong program. So like the first frame, it is drawing us, oh, right, okay, because that logic, we're still starting up with a 1080p render target, um, which we don't really want. We want to go through that whole uh, sizing logic. So I'm going to go to main here, I'm going to say, um, size off screen buffer just so that we can call it from somewhere else right and After we init OpenGL, I'll say this is also a speed issue. Maybe I don't know if I don't know if OpenGL actually instantiates the buffer until you try to use it. So it may not matter that we're creating it at a different size than we're going to use. But you know, for right now, we're just going to do this. So now the first frame should not be wrong. Uh-oh. Well, 
Now the whole program is dead. Probably something doesn't exist yet. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Oh, this slideshow is null. So we don't know the aspect ratio until after we've loaded the slideshow. So of course we can't size the off-screen buffer. So remember, we still have this weird thing where in slides, we say init slideshow, and that just says load slideshow. So we're going to get rid of that. So we're just going to just going to pull this out to there. All right. Now. There we go. Let's run it again. Boom. First frame is good. I think. Looks good. If this were Linux, we would have just said, oh, the first frame, whatever, man. Patches accepted. What makes it take so long to start up? Um, what is making it take so long is now that we're loading a bunch of images, because we're loading like four or five game screenshots, and then that giant, that one chart that I pulled in the other day is like 5,000 by 3,000, and we're decompressing them all uh, you know, from PNG, which is not particularly fast, right? So you know, when you want your slideshow to load fast, what you do is you put those things into a format that the GPU uh, already likes to play well with. For example, DXT or something like that. So at some point later on, we'll do like a cached pre-process where we load things uh, in that kind of a format. We save them out as DXT and use them later. Now the little bit of an interesting issue is that DXT I don't think does arbitrarily sized images, so uh, we may want to use a different format. I don't know what GPUs would like even use lately. Maybe there's an option besides DXT that we could use. Like BC7, is that like a thing? I don't know. But that's what you would actually do if you want to start up fast. Okay, um, let's, I, you know, I feel like that's enough programming for today, so let's do the thing about getting more screenshots, because, you know, if I collect a bunch of screenshots and we start up slower and slower, <laughs> that'll be a motivation to, uh, you know, well, before doing the caching, probably what we would do is demand load the images, right? So when we start up, we're loading all the images and that's why it takes like a second or two whereas we only need these four well we're showing four on the first slide but we're not showing like this one which is the 5,000 one which is probably taking over half the time right 
So if we demand load that, that's better in some sense because we don't pay for it when we start, but it's worse because when we flip to that slide for the first time, we would get a little like, uh. So we, I mean, we could do something crazy like background load them or something. We'll see. But, you know, I don't, I don't think it's super important yet. Okay, so we've got Steven Sausage Roll. Uh, okay, we need some more games. Not Imgur. I want images.google.com. I want Vidal Dungeon Rescue. That's pretty good. I want a legit high-res screenshot of the actual game. Maybe I have to take one myself. This is pretty good, though. No, that's 450. What? <sighs> Fidel Dungeon Rescue. XP. instance do I Photoshop software is so slow uh, so this is kind of I guess I'm gonna save it as a full screen shot but you know we don't is mostly just black pixels so Whatever. Okay, so that's a Fidel. Let's see. Let's exit Fidel. I have a Shenzhen IO shot that I took. Um, but you know, whatever. Oh, it's such a poor quality image. 720. Why? Oh my God. Am I going to have to play all these games? Okay, my, my PAX show. Hold on. Was it PAX? No. Where did I talk about Shenzhen? I O. I probably still have these slides laying around somewhere. Whatever. 480 by 36. This is why I just don't even bother. Like, all you people who take game screenshots are bad people. Okay, um, like maybe Kotaku links to a higher res. Maybe that's just their capsule image and they link to a better thing. See what this is. I don't know how big that is. Let's find out. Well, I guess I guess we don't care, right? Because we're scaling to screen sizes. So um, let's just say. We're going to make another slide with four up like this. Get rid of our UV scales. Um, maybe I'm not going to end up using this mapping very much, and it's just going to be. Are those colors right? Those colors are drastically. It's gamma wrong again. What's going on? 
I bet when I said copy image, uh, let's try going through Photoshop. That's the wrong copy image. That's a tiny image. Clipboard. Save as PNG. Fidel Dragon. Well, it looks. Oh, now the colors are right. Yeah, so something about copying it into the cut buffer like made it the wrong kind of thing. Okay. We've already got sausage roll. What do we need? I didn't change the opacity in the show file, right? Um, yeah, that would have been, uh, you know, scale color, which we're not doing. Well, I'll put a I'll put a not good Shenzhen IO because that'll that'll remind me to put in a good good one later. There's a twelve eighty by seven twenty with hella artifacts. Let's try this one. Three thirty-eight. Like, what is wrong with you people? It's twenty seventeen. Three sixty. Oh my God, Google, you're killing me. Can I like search for at least a given resolution? Is there a settings? Search settings. No, not that. Tools. just scrolled me down to here. This is punch a wall time. This is punch a wall time. All right, we'll use this one. It's not a very good shot. Okay, that took way longer than we wanted. Okay, we got that. We need some thousand one spikes. Okay, that was in my PAX presentation. Hold on a second. Let me dig that out. Except maybe I don't have PowerPoint installed on this computer. Slides. Calvino talk. I've got some mega cures. Uh, let's see. Let's see what we got here. What? Oh, those are shortcuts to, oh, to the demo, not, those aren't shots. Oh, bummer. Um, Counter-Strike, there's some witness panels. There's 1001 spikes. There's a good braid shot. Wait, which braid shot did we use? Did we already, that's not, we had that one. All right. There's another sausage roll. There's another 1,001 spikes. Okay. Whoa! Okay, I... This is good, because this is the kind of thing where it's like, all right, oh, I accidentally copied all the images because Windows is terrible. 
Uh, boom, boom, boom. You know what? Let's just get all these. We're putting them in our database, man. Actually, let me go. Uh, database, I don't know, I'm just going to call it database is where all these images live. Um, whatever. We'll pretend like this one is like the current slideshow and this is a history of things. And yeah, let's add those. We gotta add this and boom. Counter strike. Witness silence. Yes. Atari twenty six hundred. This is all good. So, let's use a couple of these. Whoops, I didn't want to edit the thing. I wanted to, wanted to copy, how do I copy the file name? So we'll call that one, oh geez, I have to SVN rename it. Isn't it funny how you can do all this programming really quickly, but then just random generic wrangling of a couple of things is takes all this turn? Okay, so that's in a different folder than this other stuff, but uh, should be fine. So I'm going to say load image cs is counter strike source, and for sausage we're going to have cs. Oh, we're looking at the wrong slide. There we go. Uh, it didn't work, though. Some, we were unable to find asset counter strike source. You know, maybe I'm not looking in subfolders right now. Yeah. So I copied it back there and it appeared. Um, so I'm not going to do that because I'm going to wind down this stream, but uh, on the to-do list for next time is going to be look in subfolders for assets. Look in subfolders for assets. Did I not call it that? Oh, no, because I... 1001 greatest level ever made dot jpeg greatest level ever made really let's just maybe it's not a jpeg that's possible i bet it's not a jpeg and just People are looking at the magic numbers and we're not. No, it is JPEG. That's what JFIF means. What's going on? Why can't we load it? Oh, 
I need to load image file. One thousand one. It must be failing to load. This might be okay. This might be uh, a version of JPEG that lib uh, stb image does not handle. So let's. We could test that, for example, by pulling it in here. Like, why is it JPEG in the first place? It's a freaking pixel image. So let's do that. Wait. Like, an image like this should not be JPEG anyway. Okay, so now it loaded. So now we have eight cool games, but on the to-do list is going to go figure out why we are not loading images in the subfolder. Maybe we'll do polylines and whatnot. Uh, but I think that's enough for today's session. This has been good. Uh, we did borders around images, right? We did image tiling, and we did window resizing, and correct aspect ratio handling in the resizing. And, uh, you know, it's starting to be a real program. It's pretty good. We maybe did one or two other things that I even forgot about. Any final questions before I stop the stream? Maybe make Letterbox the slide background color. Yeah, you totally would want to do that, or at least have the option to do that. The reason I'm making it an annoying, clashing color right now is just so I can see it, because we're in early days, and we want to make sure it works, that it's even, you know. We want to make sure the slide definitely goes either to the sides or to the top and bottom. So uh, for a while, we're going to draw it ugly like this, uh, and then eventually probably just fill it out. Would it be useful to allow pasting or dragging images directly into the slideshow program? Uh, yes, when we have a graphical editor, which we don't have yet. So, yeah. You can Google search with specified image size. All right. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably options for it. It's just in the... 10 seconds I was willing to figure it out, I didn't figure it out. Hmm. Right, so what I call in, so we're talking about what do we do for this? Um, would I call invalidate rect when I get a WM size? And then that's going to cause us to paint? Doesn't it always... No, guys, I clicked on tools and it like popped me down to the bottom of the window. It didn't even do what I expected when I clicked on that. I thought that was going to be a menu and it like ejected me. So I don't know what y'all are talking about. Do I plan to add drawing over slides during a presentation? Yes. Um, well, I, yeah, that was a glitch. You have to scroll back up. Whatever. I was only spending 10 seconds figuring it out, and Google failed me in those 10 seconds. So, yes, they lost. That's how it goes.
Look, stop, guys, stop making excuses for the web. When something like that happens, it's not the user's fault. It's the web's fault when that happens. It doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter that it was like loading a page from the server and it was a little slow. It's the web's fault. And those things should be fixed. And if you think that web software is good, if you're one of these people who thinks that we should be implementing applications using web technologies, then it's your job to fix that stuff. And if you don't, it's your fault that software is crappy. So don't be telling me like, oh, you just had to blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't have to do anything. I pushed the correct button at the correct time and the page failed to do anything sensible. That is the only way to look at that situation. Don't make excuses for bad software. We've had enough of that. It wasn't even that much caffeine. It was just a little bit. Um, so somehow I feel like saying invalidate rect in the middle of WM size isn't going to make this paint, right? Um, let's see what people have to say about Windows, how to repaint while resizing. Or in Java. This is going to be horrible. Components, add component listener, no, goodbye. Do not repaint window during resize. Draw while resizing window at OpenGL. I note the new size along with the fact that a resize occurred, but nothing else during the WM paint event. I check if a resize occurred, and if so, I call GL viewport with the new size. And then... See, I don't do anything from within WM paint. Right. I mean, I do. I do the following. What's going on with Emacs now? Window, uh, talking about software failing us, it's not only web software that fails us. I can't, well, maybe I just can't move Emacs out of the way now. It's just locked to a certain, I don't know what it's doing. It's like the cursor position is off and it it won't respond to anything. Okay, that's where we're at in the year 2017. Um, so I'll open a new Emacs to show you what I do. Uh, wait, it's in... Um, Maybe it's just in here. No, it's in, I use the generic one. So I create window. No, not that create window. I want the windows create window. We call create window, the window class, window classes are the dumbest thing too. Okay, so we have my window proc is what it's called. Oh, do I just define that right now? Where's my window proc? It's just in Windows input. All right. Okay. So basically, when we get WM Paint, we just say validate rect and call def window proc. Like we do not do non-trivial application functionality when processing this message because that's stupid, right? Now, if what that means is that you can't 
paint while resizing on Windows, then I'm not sure that I feel strongly enough about that to do something bad. I think Windows should just fix their situation. Um, I suspect there's another way to do it, um, but I don't know. I don't know what that is. Like probably the reason I'm not painting is that the application is blocking during sizing on, you know, peak message or something. I don't know. So if we can like make the application not block at that time and then draw to whatever the current window size is. And then when you get around here later with the next paint message we validate wrecked, then, then that probably makes sense. I don't know. It is blocking during the sizing. That's why the temp WM timer. But what what call is blocking exactly? Is it like um, is it peak message that blocks or or what? That timer thing sounds ugly, man. I don't I don't think I want anything to do with that. It stops both message loop and the program when you're moving sizing. WMNC paint. Right. Okay. I don't remember that much about what non-client paint means, but let me look it up. Yeah, I just, uh, maybe I'll entertain something ugly like that next time. I just don't, I, I'm having a good time programming reasonably clean things, and I, I just don't want to descend into that horrible place. The WMNC paint message is sent to a window when its frame must be painted. Application can paint its own. Oh, that's just for the window frame. Right. Um, I don't I don't see how that helps me unless I can respond to NC paint in some way that prevents the blocking. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to mess with the non-client area. All right, that's going to be it for now. Um, maybe we'll talk next time about doing the ugly thing. <laughs> Something like that. Thanks for coming by, and I'll see you all later on.